Thanks for attending our Earth Day program tonight. League of Women Voters Bloomington has an Earth Day program every year, and we're excited about tonight's program. Um, it's on air quality, and we have a great panel. My name's Mary Rice. I'm president of the local league, and I just have a few preliminary comments. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that never endorses any political party or candidate. Our purpose in hosting this program is to provide the public with information that's useful to you in making your choices in voting. Our League uh, also, every year, does uh, some other things. One of the things we do is we do candidate videos of all of the local candidates, and those videos uh, are played back on Bloomington TV, and they're also played back through our website and through the city website. We also host candidate forums and uh, have a voter information guide that we put out every year that identifies local candidates and also uh, explains everything that we're able to explain about voting, where to vote, uh, and that kind of thing, absentee voting, how far in advance you can vote, all of those things. So watch for those things and, and especially watch for our candidate videos and our candidate forums later this year. This event is being recorded for later playback by Bloomington TV and it will be also, also be accessible through the websites of the League and uh, the City of Bloomington. I want to thank the City of Bloomington for allowing us to use this space and I'd also like to thank Bloomington TV for filming this. Finally, I want to thank Lois Norgard, who is a League member who led the committee that organized this forum. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, Lois is going to moderate this event, and I'll turn this over to Lois. Oh, and one more thing. Um, after the speakers are done speaking, that'll take about an hour. We'll have about 25 minutes for questions and answers. So anyway, with that, I'll turn this over to Lois. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, yeah, I'm Lois Norgard. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters in Bloomington, and I've been in Bloomington for, oh boy, 36 years. So very active with environmental issues. So I like to work with our environmental or Earth Day program every year. And tonight we're going to have a very excellent program. We've got three speakers that are each going to cover a little bit different part of our air quality issues and what's going on here today in Minnesota, as well as um, some the science behind it and some of the actions that's going on at the state level. So I want to introduce, we'll have three speakers, they'll each come up, we'll have about 20 minutes each, and then we'll have a panel at the end. I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Peter Rayner. He's an associate professor at, in the Division of Environmental Health and Sciences at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. He has a BS in chemical engineering from Cornell University and an MS and PhD degree in environmental sciences and engineering from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His research and teaching interests revolve around the assessment and control of exposure to air pollutants, especially those involving airborne particles. So with that, I'd like to ask Dr. Rayner to come up. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Very special that he's here with us tonight. Thank you, Lois. I appreciate the kind comments, and uh, thank you. And thank you all for coming out on our first beautiful spring evening. It must have been tempting not to come inside, but I appreciate you being here. Um, so I'm going to give a kind of a, a brief overview of air pollution that our other speakers will sort of riff off of, I think. Um, so let's get started. Um, so we're talking about air. So what is air? Air is a mixture of gases. Um, including when it's dry, about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% um, argon, which is uh, a noble gas, not very reactive. Uh, the fourth most prevalent compound in dry air is carbon dioxide, which right now is around 0.04% and we know is going upwards. Um, water vapor is a highly variable component of air. It can vary from almost 0% up, up to greater than 4% uh, depending on weather and temperature. Um, this is a little diagram that shows the layers of the atmosphere. And uh, at the top we have the thermosphere. The air is very, very, very thin up there. Um, somewhere around 70 to over 100 miles up in the air is the ionosphere where the aurora uh, 
persist. Uh, below the thermosphere is the mesosphere, and below that is the stratosphere, where we have the ozone layer, the, the good ozone that protects us from UV radiation. Um, and then lowest, closest to the Earth, is the troposphere. And these, these different layers are separated um, by mixing zone, or zones that don't mix very well, so there's some separation there, and then different temperature profiles. Uh, but I did want to talk about the troposphere a little bit. That's, that's a, the zone that we live in. It's maybe about six miles thick. Um, airplanes can fly a little bit above the, the troposphere. Uh, but that includes every, every place that we walk on Earth. So uh, Mount Everest is a little less, between five and six miles high up in the, uh, uh, the atmosphere. Um, so if you think about it, people can climb Mount Everest without oxygen. Some of the very hardiest climbers, they have to get right back down again because the air is so thin up there that um, it is, uh, you can't survive for very long. So at the very best, people may be able to live or, or, or exist for a little while at four or five miles up in the atmosphere, but um, even at those elevations, not for very long because of the thinness of the air. So, you know, the, the, the thickness where we can live, everything we've ever done as a species um, is sort of in that five mile zone. And if I look at, I live in St. Louis Park. So if I, when I drive home this evening, I'll be driving more than three times that width of, of the livable atmosphere. So it's a precious commodity um, and something we, we need to protect. Oops. So uh, how do we define pollution? If we're talking, we've defined air a little bit, let's talk about pollution. Um, the US EPA define, has defined pollution as the presence of a substance in the environment that because of its chemical composition or quantity prevents the functioning of natural processes and produces undesirable environmental and health effects. So a couple things that are important in there, the, the fact that the composition or the quantity of uh, chemicals in the air um, may cause some adverse effects either uh, on people, human health, animals, can be affected as well, and then uh, on the environment in general. So it's those things that are, are is pollution, the, the undesirable, the chemicals that cause undesirable effects. Now, um, the EPA, as well as the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, have defined criteria air pollutants, air pollutants that we follow most closely to evaluate national and regional air quality. And the EPA has six criteria air pollutants. They include carbon monoxide, which is primarily a, a product of combustion of different types, but including motor vehicles. Um, lead, which comes most commonly now from smelters and battery plants. There is a, a battery plant in Egan um, that uh, is, uh, has been in the past at least a, a source of lead into the atmosphere. Uh, nitrogen dioxide, which is a product of combustion also. Um, ozone, which we don't admit ozone directly to the atmosphere. Um, it's a pro byproduct of volatile organic compounds and oxides of nitrogen, both of which can be products of vehicle emissions and other combustion. Uh, and you need sunlight for the formation of ozone. And this is the, the bad ozone, the ozone in the troposphere, the ozone that does not help us and protect us from UV. It, it's, a, it's a hazard that can cause lung damage and adverse lung function. Um, we have particulate matter, which can also be a product of combustion. It can also be formed by gases uh, in the atmosphere, and some of those gases are products of combustion. And then sulfur dioxide, which has primarily come from uh, using coal and oil in energy production. Um, so you can see a lot of those, uh, all of them basically, uh, other than lead, have uh, a source, or some of the sources come from combustion processes, including motor vehicles. Um, Minnesota also has a seventh criteria, air pollutant, hydrogen sulfide, that's primarily on the, the books um, in, in um, rural regions to protect against odor from livestock operations. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this slide going into detail, but I, I do want to let you know that there are national ambient air quality standards for the six EPA uh, criteria pollutants. Um, and those standards are looked at uh, across the country in different 
metropolitan areas and different regions in order to evaluate air quality. And there's, for some of the criteria air pollutants, there are multiple standards that may encompass, for instance, different sizes of airborne particles. They may encompass different averaging times for the concentrations that are in the air. So you may look at something that's averaged over a year or something that's averaged over a day. The reason I mentioned the National Ambient Air Quality Standards or the NOx is I wanted to show this slide that tracks over the last 25 years or so the levels of pollutants that we have on average across the United States. And you can see generally on, on the um, on the horizontal axis here is time going from 1990 to 2016. And on the vertical axis, you have percentage relative to those national ambient air quality standards that we talked about on the last slide. And on the left here, it goes from 100% greater than the standard to 100% below the standard, meaning zero. Whoops. Um, and that's for everything except for lead. Lead is on the right vertical axis, and it goes from plus 1,500% to minus 1,500%, which of course isn't possible. You can't be 1,500% below a standard. So it really, you know, it stops here at about minus 100%. So I want to point out that the trends for all the criteria air pollutants are downward, which is a great thing. Our air has gotten cleaner over the last 26 years and for some pollutants more than others. Um, uh, nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide uh, have been low throughout that period, well below their standards. Um, a great success story has come with sulfur dioxide as greater controls have been put in place, uh, particularly to prevent um, acid precipitation in many parts of the country. Um, so the levels have gone down pretty significantly. Um, even for particulate matter, over the last, oh, 15 years or so, we've seen um, declines there. Lead has had a change in order of magnitude lowering of the standard in this period. And it's gone down from, you know, close to 1,500% above the current standard to well below that on average. These are averages across the country, mind you. Um, so that's a, a success story as well. Ozone has been kind of resistant not completely, it's gone down on average, but not nearly as much as the others, and has uh, kind of been hovering around the current standard on average across the US. Um, so this is a, a chart that comes from EPA that um, talks about uh, in the year of 2016, how many people in the US lived in areas that were um, in excess of one or more of these uh, standards. So you can see um, for at least one of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, uh, about around a third of the US population lived in areas that exceeded one or more of these standards. And then they break it down here into individual pollutants. And you can see that by uh, the majority of that is due to ozone as you might suspect, because that was the one that was closest to its standard. Um, there's also significant numbers of people who um, live above one or more of the particulate matter standards, so airborne particles. And those numbers don't add up because there are areas where some residents are um, see elevated levels of both ozone and particulate matter. So, you know, we might say, oh boy, our, our air quality isn't perfect, it's gotten better. I do want to put it in perspective of the global um, um, nature of air pollution. And this shows um, particulate matter 10, PM10, which is airborne particles 10 micrometers and smaller in size. Uh, so 10 micrometers is maybe about 20% the diameter of the average human hair. So it's, it's a pretty small size of particle, and it's all those particles in smaller sizes. And if you look over at the, the map where the US is, you see a lot of green, which is sort of the lowest level there. That's the, the, the type of uh, particulate matter that we're exposed to. And you can see 
Um, some green and more yellow in, in Europe and Australia and Japan. But then you go to, to countries where there's um, the developing world, China, India, other parts of the world where you have significantly elevated concentrations of particulate matter. And we see the news reports from India and China where you see these, these fogs sometimes during the year and, and the PM10 is, is uh, reflecting that. Um, the other thing I, that you might note is in Africa, where there's very large populated cities, there's not a lot of data. Um, and this comes from the World Health Organization, so they're compiling data from across the world. Um, so we don't know everything that goes on in all parts of the world. So uh, this is just to point out that even though we're talking about our air, that if we put it in perspective, other parts of the world are worse off than we, we are, and particularly um, those parts of the world that um, are are um, still developing. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what uh, we see in the Twin Cities and how is our air monitored regionally. So this map shows um, ozone monitors in the Twin Cities region. And you can see that there's, there's some kind of on the outskirts of the region, St. Michael, Shakopee, um, an ozone monitor in, in Minneapolis, uh, Blaine, and I forget exactly where that one is along the Wisconsin border. So there's not a lot of ozone monitoring sites that go into these um, evaluations of the local air quality. You'll notice none of them are in Bloomington. Um, for, for fine particles, particles that are 2.5 micrometers and smaller, so even smaller than the PM10, there's more monitoring sites, but still none in Bloomington. Most of these sites are uh, uh, on roofs of government buildings or schools, things like that. They're not at uh, um, ground height, typically, and they uh, are not personal measures of the exposures to different air pollution, uh, and different criteria air pollutants. So they reflect kind of the regional air quality that everyone might be exposed to, but not the measures for what any one person might be exposed to. Uh, but the story, if we look at the Twin Cities air quality over the last, let's see, 15 years or so, and this comes from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, um, you can see that over time, uh, our air quality has gotten better. This is a number of days with different air quality indices. So the air quality index is published on a daily basis uh, by the Pollution Control Agency, and uh, it it's, uh, can be quantified as good, uh, moderate, unhealthy for sensitive people, or unhealthy. Um, I've never seen it go beyond the unhealthy level here. And uh, you can see that over time we've had a lot more good days, particularly even in the last 10 years or so, uh, we've seen a trend for, for better and better air um, here in the Twin Cities, which is a good thing. But there's still some days that are unhealthy for sensitive people. And in 2016, I, I believe we had one day that was in the unhealthy level um, uh, for the region. What are the sources that contribute to some of the pollutants here in Minnesota? And we've got sort of four main uh, pollutants here, fine particles again, the PM 2.5 which diesel exhaust is part of that. Um, nitrogen oxides, like nitrogen dioxide. Uh, we didn't talk about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are not a criteria air pollutant, but they can be a cancer-causing agent that um, can be both in particulate form and in gaseous form in the atmosphere. And then volatile organic compounds, which help contribute to ozone formation, along with nitrogen oxides. But the bottom line is what I want to point out here is there's a lot of sources related to Wood burning, particularly for fine particles, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So that could be backyard fires in the summer. It can be wood burning stoves in the winter. Uh, you also have forest fires for the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And then also a lot of vehicle emissions. So we're all contributing to these emissions. Uh, none of us is, is really uh, gets off scot-free. We can't blame the industry industries for all this, we, we are all contributing to the formation of these pollutants, whether through our cars, 
through our consumption of gasoline that can release VOCs, um, our, our purchasing of products that are trucked into the stores. So all of these, uh, and our recreation vehicles, they can all contribute to these pollutants. I want to talk a little bit more about roadway pollutants and um, their effects on PM pollution, uh, particulate matter pollution. This is a study from a former colleague, Julian Marshall, from uh, the Civil Engineering Department at, at the U. And they were looking at both uh, PM 2.5 concentrations, so that's the criteria air pollutant. There's a, a national ambient air quality standard for that. And also particle number concentrations, which can, which can reflect the very smallest particles that we think may be even uh, the biggest contributor to some of the adverse health effects associated with particle, particle pollution. And what they were looking at here was uh, different uh, types of roads that uh, they rode bikes along, bicycles, and whether they're major arteries, collector streets, local streets, or actually off street, like in parks. So there wasn't that much change overall um, in the PM 2.5, but in the, the particle number concentrations, the smallest particles, you do, do see a decline as you get to less traveled roads and, and off roads by about maybe a third lower. If you also look at distance from a major roadway, um, again, you don't see much difference with the PM 2.5, but with the smallest particles, the particle number concentration, if you're more than 400 or more than 300 meters from the major road versus being uh, on the major road, you can see a reduction by about half in your exposure. So there's going to be some inequities associated with that. I wanted to um, show a couple of maps that are fascinating and a little, little disturbing at the same time uh, related to some of these inequities. This is a map from 19... 35, it was published in 1937, looking at different sections of Minneapolis. Um, I've got one for St. Paul, too. And they use what we would consider now to be um, racist terms for some groups. They were trying to show who settled and who lived in which areas of Minneapolis. They use an outdated term for African Americans. Um, in this map, um, they, they talk about um, immigrant areas where people have settled. Uh, but more recently, a uh, cartographer, Jeff Moss, uh, overlaid this map with where the interstate highways were laid out in Minneapolis. And the areas where people of color were primarily living in the 1930s are shown uh, primarily in darker brown. And then uh, the roads that were laid out 15 years later before the interstates were built are shown uh, overlaid. And you can see that the roads were laid out through some of the areas where people of color lived and where people of color still live and where people of lower socioeconomic status live. And there's a similar map for St. Paul with a similar result, including, as has been discussed many times, um, Interstate 94 going right through the Rondo neighborhood um, in St. Paul. So how does this play out in, in exposures and health effects? So this is a paper from Greg Pratt, Monica Vidaly, um, Dorian uh, Cavale, and Christy Ellickson from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And it shows in the upper left corner uh, the, the percentages of people by color. Um, the color scale shows um, the proportion of non-white people in, in parts of the seven county area. So the red areas are where there's a greater proportion of people of color. And this figure shows traffic density. So you can see uh, along here uh, would be 494 and 35W and uh, where the most traffic density is. And it's, of course, along the major arteries. Um, it shows the vehicles per household. So um, in the central cities, fewer vehicles per household. Um, people may not need their vehicles as much in the central cities. They may not be able to afford to have as many vehicles in the central cities. And then the estimated cancer risk from those road sources. So what's interesting to see is that um, the greatest cancer risk is experienced near roadways where more people of color live 
um, and yet they have fewer vehicles. So it talks a little bit about um, air pollution inequities. One other thing I wanted to bring up before finishing, because um, we're in Bloomington, I know there's an airport near here, right? Um, this is a, a paper from a few years ago from Los Angeles, um, where they tracked by driving um, across the flight path of planes coming in and landing at LAX airport, what the, again, the smallest fine particle levels were at ground level um, along that flight path. And of course, as you get farther and farther away from the airport, it gets lower, but you still measure, uh, see some particles as much as uh, 10 miles or, or no, 10 kilometers downwind or upwind, I guess downwind from the airport um, as the flights come in. Uh, and these are the, the ultimately how much health risk that has for residents is uncertain, uh, but it's provocative and, and it makes me, you know, I don't think anybody's done anything like that near MSP airport. Uh, it would be an interesting activity to find out, particularly to compare warmer and colder times of year too, because, you know, we, we have a different weather pattern in the winter than Los Angeles does. And I don't want to finish without um, mentioning indoor air pollution. There's many, many sources indoors that may create um, greater health hazards than you have from the outdoor air, um, and, and you have more control over some of those sources. So things like radon gas coming in into basements. Um, can, is, radon is the second leading um, cause of lung cancer after smoking, and, and so that can be a serious issue, uh, particularly if you have children that spend a lot of time in the basement or if you have basement bedrooms. Um, other so sources of combustion are particularly concerned if you have a attached garages and you start up your car and let it warm up. Um, that's something you should consider not doing um, in order to reduce your own personal exposures. Uh, um, smoking certainly should be something you don't do if you can avoid it. Um, so other sources of combustion like that, um, incense sticks, a lot of smoke particles. Um, so those are things that you have some control over in your own space. So just some take-home points. Our atmosphere is thin and precious like I talked about at the beginning. Um, exposures to the criteria air pollutants that I talked about uh, both nationally and regionally have decreased significantly over the last few decades. Proximity to traffic is associated with um, race and socioeconomic status and in turn, that may lead to higher exposures to those people uh, that live close to traffic. And lastly, air pollution created that you create inside your home uh, may also be something that's important and maybe more important than the outside air in some, at some times. Um, so that's all I had. that I run up and down, but I want to see the shows. So um, our next speaker here is John Hunter. He has come, he's working with the, uh, he's a director of the clean air at the American Lung Association in Minnesota. So John has been at the American Lung Association for eight years and has a degree in physics from Hamlin University right here in St. Paul. So with that, I'll have John come up and duck out again. <laughs> I'll see if I can get away. This is Amanda's presentation, and this, as much as she'd like me to give it, I'm going to guess she's better at it than I am. So let me see what I can get away with. Oh, that was me. Okay. Sweet. Um, so thank you for, for having me. Uh, I'm happy to be a, a part of the presentation here today. Uh, I think I'm going to attempt to sort of bridge uh, the professor's uh, talk with um, sort of ta starting to bridge in more a little bit on the health side of things and start getting towards some other different kind of actions uh, we can take along the way. Um, but a quick background uh, about us, you know, I, admittedly, I know when people start thinking traffic, the, uh, the American Lung Association is not always the first uh, name that pops to their, their mind. Um, but, you know, our mission is really to, to save lives um, by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. So one of the ways we obviously kind of need to go about doing that is uh, working on the improving the air we breathe, because uh, that is such a major consequence for the health uh, all of us kind of um, need and, uh, and, and work with. 
Um, we also staff uh, what's known as the Twin Cities Clean Cities Coalition. Uh, this is a, a Department of Energy uh, program, the Clean Cities program, that's dedicated to petroleum reduction. Um, there's obviously our hope to, will become obvious at least uh, that there's a lot of natural overlap between kind of reducing the uh, use of petroleum in our society and uh, the air we breathe and the, the air quality. So uh, we like to think it's a, a good natural partnership between us and the Department of Energy. Uh, the Clean Cities program is a national program that's implemented with uh, 100 or so local coalitions, very similar to us, um, though very, very few others are, are actually operated by the lung associations. But um, So um, I will try to, I, I have a little bit of overlap with the uh, professor, um, but I will try not to dwell too much on that. Um, we'll see, hopefully this picture shows up well, but on the left side um, is, is not Minneapolis, it's Denver. Uh, and sort of Denver's, uh, I guess you call it somewhat infamous brown cloud, if you will. Uh, this is also a few miles from where I grew up. Um, so uh, I very much, I grew up, I guess, kind of used to people talking about air quality alert days and uh, kind of knowing when you, you got back to town from the mountains that you might get headaches and uh, really starting, you know, I guess having that everyday visual reminder. Um, and in many ways, the Twin Cities and Denver were about the same size. You know, population-wise, we're, we're almost the same. Um, our, you know, geography, though, is is notably different, I guess. Uh, and so Denver happens to kind of sit in a river valley right next to mountains that um, are very good at trapping air uh, at times and kind of locking in that pollution. Whereas Minneapolis-St. Paul, we have more of a ge or geographical advantage that a lot of our pollution kind of gets blown out more. And it's not necessarily that we're not producing as much. It's just it's the, the weather is such that it doesn't get trapped here as much. And so uh, consequently, the air quality differences are, are um, very striking at times. Um, I also, of course, being from the Lung Association, will dwell more on lung health related things. But I did want to include this graphic from the Pollution Control Agency, uh, highlighting the fact that um, really there, there are issues with air quality related to throughout the body. Um, a lot of the pollution we'll talk about can get into the blood system and travel throughout the body and, and cause problems in the brain and in other organs throughout the body. Um, but I, of course, like to talk lungs, so uh, we'll dwell there for the most part. Uh, and what, as uh, I think uh, Professor Rennert um, demonstrated earlier, is what a lot of Minnesotans don't realize is, is vehicle emissions are the single largest source of, of those kind of criteria pollutants he was talking about earlier. So that really is, has been why uh, the Lung Association for the last 20 years has kind of um, focused on tailpipes and, and what we can do about it here in Minnesota. Um, so again, as, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, ozone formation, and then again, this is the ground level ozone that, that we don't want to breathe but um, can have consequences is a, a combination of other pollutants in the air that react in hot summer days uh, to form ozone. So it, it's, it's the, what we like to call NOx, the nitrogen oxides um, coming out of tailpipes, forming with VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, uh, which are chemicals that come from industrial sources, from fuel, from uh, factories, all kinds of other things. They react in the sunlight uh, to form ozone. Uh, one of the reasons the, the Pollution Control Agency monitors for ozone uh, more typically in the suburbs than in the cities um, is because of that reaction time kind of needed between when a, a pollutant is emitted and when it actually forms into ozone. Uh, so our ozone problems do tend to be in suburbs and, and not in the, the urban core, uh, whereas particulate emissions tend to be much closer to the source. Or, well, I should say the primary particulate emissions are much closer to the source. So that's why they, they monitor those more in the middle of the city um, versus as out here. And it just so happens that our, our weather systems tend to carry a lot of that pollution north um, during the, the high ozone seasons. Um, so you're a little bit lucky on the side of town, I guess. Uh, but that's not to say we don't have our, our issues for sure. Um, so what ozone does, um, what people kind of refer to ozone as when you breathe it in, it, um, high ozone levels, they compare it to like a sunburn on your lungs, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, it's, you know, you can picture that sort of red inflammation kind of um, irritation that you, you can picture a sunburn doing. It's kind of similar inside your lungs with, with really high ozone days. And you can imagine if, if you have asthma, uh, where your lungways are already kind of constricted or other respiratory um, issues like COPD, that irritation can be enough to trigger asthma attacks. It can 
trigger hospitalizations, other, other kind of problems. Um, so it can be a, a, enough to push people over the edge if they're um, particularly sensitive to it. Uh, a graphic to demonstrate what um, Professor Rainer was, was talking about with particulate emissions. Um, you know, they say human hair is, is about 20 to 30 times larger uh, than, than the PM 2.5 we talk about. Um, and uh, this doesn't even get into it, but when he was talking particle numbers, we have the PM 2.5, which is 2.5 microns. Uh, when you start talking particle numbers, you're talking about 0.1 microns. So again, another 20, 25 times smaller than uh, the PM 2.5. So super, super tiny, tiny kind of things. Um, and you can imagine you know, how easily this would travel into our airways, uh, into our lungs. The very, the, you know, PM 2.5 and smaller, uh, some of it can get lodged deep into the lungs where it's hard to get out. Um, some of it is cancer causing or, or uh, carries with it toxins that can be problematic. Uh, some of it is small enough that it will pass through the, the lung lining into the bloodstream and that's where it can kind of travel around the blood uh, and throughout to the different organs, that kind of stuff throughout the body. So it's also very highly associated with cardio, uh, cardiovascular problems and heart attacks and, and that kind of stuff. Um, hospitalizations tend to go up a, a day or two after uh, high air, uh, particulate emission days. Uh, because it, you know, it resonates through kind of through the body. Um, it is similar to ozone in that it can trigger asthma attacks and, and other respiratory issues. It also is the one most associated with uh, premature death um, for a, a variety of, of different health reasons. Um, so it tends to come with uh, what people consider a, a high um, economic value, I guess you'd say, of, of the pollution that it causes. Um, Converse to, I guess, ozone, uh, our, our highest particulate emission uh, issues tend to be in winter um, when maybe the air exchange isn't quite as high or if different weather patterns will set up and kind of uh, more apt to lock our pollution in. Uh, as uh, the professor mentioned, this is you know also typically associated with wood burning and other kind of things. So there are a variety of issues that can kind of all, all pile up um, in winter. And, but that's not to say we don't have problems throughout other times of the year, too. Um, so starting to boil down, I think, national stuff into to more local kind of things. Um, last week, the, uh, the National Lung Association released our, our 19th annual State of the Air report, uh, which is kind of a report card for what air quality is like uh, throughout the country. So it's, it's looking at the, um, the EPA's kind of assessments and the, the um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's air quality monitoring. Uh, looks over the last few years and, and develops grades for everywhere that's out there. And uh, Hennepin County is, is fortunate to have relatively good um, air quality. A B is considered, uh, is, is based on averaging one uh, day or less per year of uh, what fit into the orange category in uh, Pete's chart. That, that was the, the category of where air quality starts to be impactful for people with respiratory issues, but not quite impactful for the, the vast majority of us. Or there's, I guess, less of a warning for us, I should put it that way. Um, so overall, our, our air quality is decent. Um, there are other parts of the state that, um, like Ramsey County had, I think, a C in the, the particulate pollution and some other areas like that. Um, so it's all kind of here. Um, we have been worse. We're getting a little bit better, um, but we still have, have more work to do. Uh, I will mention at the, the website, lung.org slash SOTA is the state of the air. Uh, there's additional information that um, can kind of help, I think, uh, add some, I guess, numbers to some of the issues that the uh, professor was talking about uh, just a moment ago in that it, you know, on Hennepin County, for example, it kind of dives into what are the more vulnerable populations look like, that kind of thing. So in, in Hennepin County, we have about 1.2 million people who live in our county. Um, of that, that's about 18,750 uh, children who have asthma. That's about 7% uh, of, of kids have, have asthma. Um, about 7, 74,000 adults with asthma, 35,000 with, with COBD. Um, and to to dwell, I guess, or reinforce uh, the disparities kind of discussion, uh, not only are um, populations of color and, and lower income communities more likely to be exposed to air pollution, but they're more likely to, to have health consequences that can be exacerbated by air pollution. So the African American population uh, tends to have asthma rates at two and a half times that of like the white population in Minnesota. 
Um, American Indians also are, are tend to be you know twice the average or, or more. So they not only have the air pollution kind of affecting them, but they're more likely to have health consequences because uh, related to or exacerbated by the air pollution. Um, uh, this is kind of a different way of, of looking at uh, professors' uh, measurements of air quality and, and how we've been doing. Um, so in the case of my chart, uh, which I also conveniently stole from the Pollution Control Agency, 100% uh, is where the federal standards currently are set. Um, for uh, this is for ozone and, and particulate emissions in particular. Um, and you can see on this chart, like we, we are keeping just below the line. Um, the trick here is the um, Environmental Protection Agency is uh, under the Clean Air Act. They're supposed to revisit uh, these standards every five years or so. Uh, and the last time the, the ozone standard was revisited um, was just 2013 or so? 20, no, 2015. Um, the, their science advisory committee recommended uh, that we lower the standard from 75 parts per billion in ozone to somewhere between 60 and 70 parts per billion. Uh, we at the Lung Association said, you know, take the protective self, uh, you know, the, the most protective standard for that, go for 60. Um, they set it at 70. Uh, and so that, that 70 parts per billion is that uh, is what becomes 100% on this chart. Um, but if you add in where 60 would have been, it takes us down below where our current air, zone, our air quality levels are. Uh, so that is all to say for us, um, we feel lowering our air quality would have protective health benefits uh, and that there would be a lot of benefits to having our air pollution lower. Uh, and this isn't just for the Twin Cities. Um, you know, it, this purple line, I think, is probably for the Twin Cities, I'm guessing. Off the top of my head, it's probably around 60. No, it's even lower than 68, 65. Um, but R Rochester has issues that would be above this dotted line. Marshall has issues that would be above this dotted line. So it's not just a, tw a Twin Cities kind of thing. It is a statewide thing. Uh, we obviously are most focused on the health consequences, but um, it does also does start to affect crops uh, production and forest growth and, and all kinds of secondary issues as well. Um, so it's not just a, a human health issue. Um, you can also kind of see where our, our particulate emissions are kind of borderline too. We're, um, we've had a couple of good years to help bring our averages down, but uh, we're much closer than I would like us to be. I'll put it that way. Um, and the particulate emission level is supposed to be revisited any old day now, um, but I'm not going to hold my breath if you don't mind the pun. Um, so real quickly, just want to talk about uh, climate change and health as well, because uh, there are um, sort of lung health consequences uh, with the, the what we see in climate change uh, right now too. Um, one, an easy one obviously, is, is increased ozone formation with, with hotter summers. As mentioned, you need that hot sunny day kind of reaction time. So hotter summers mean more likelihood of ozone formation. Uh, wildfire pollution is, is another thing. The, the worst air quality we've had in the Twin Cities in the last few years has actually been from wildfire smoke farther out west, uh, traveling high up into the atmosphere, and the, and the weather pattern setting up just right to bring that smoke back down on us. So it's, it's wildfires in Alberta and uh, Washington State, you know, these kind of drought-fueled type things going on in, in bigger forests farther away. Uh, but has brought us that sort of health consequences as a result. Um, our, poll our pollen it, and sort of allergy seasons are changing. Um, compared to when I was in college, which sadly was 20 years ago now, um, our, our ragweed season is three weeks longer than it was um, in, in 1999. So that not only exposes people to longer sessions, um, but the it turns out the pollen in higher carbon atmospheres becomes more potent as an allergen too. I mentioned ragweed because it's um, kind of the most, it's the most common or most frequent uh, allergen that, that people react to, even if they don't have other respiratory symptoms. Um, but allergies are, are what employees consider um, the, the biggest reason for what they call presenteeism, where somebody might be at work, but they're just kind of feeling bad and they're not, they're not living up to their full productivity. And that has a real economic burden on it. Um, but it can also trigger asthma issues and, and other kind of respiratory um, situations as well. Um, so we're an extra three weeks, I guess, of, of longer kind of allergy growing seasons. Um, more mosquitoes and ticks as well, like everybody's favorite uh, 
kind of things that you can you can like to see. Um, but as you all probably know, like mosquitoes and ticks, they carry disease with them a lot of the time. Uh, so Lyme disease in Minnesota, uh, West Nile virus, those kind of things are, are transported by uh, the insects. And in Minnesota, their ranges are expanding. They're getting farther and farther north. They're getting more widespread. Um, and it's an issue we'll continue to kind of have to, to deal with um, more and more. So those are a few examples. There are a lot more uh, kind of examples of climate health. But I do want to kick into, I guess, kind of things we can start doing. Um, and I'll get into sort of what we can do each individually. Uh, we'll talk a little bit federal, and then we'll save um, kind of state-level discussions for, for later. Um, so if you are a driver, um, you know, some, some basic kind of tips can help you uh, reduce your own emissions, uh, regardless of what kind of vehicle you're using. Uh, properly inflating your tires um, makes a big difference, 3 to 5% in fuel mileage. Um, combining trips, uh, driving the speed limit is actually a really helpful way of uh, reducing your, your fuel emissions. Our engines are designed to, to, to be optimized, uh, basically what typically is below the speed limit, actually, for highway speeds. Um, not idling when you're, uh, you know, not moving. If, you know, if you're going to be somewhere for 30 seconds or more, uh, you should turn off your car. Uh, I know in the winter it's kind of hard, but your car will actually warm up a lot quicker if you're driving than if, uh, um, if you're just letting it sit in the driveway, go for a long time. So uh, don't be afraid to get in that cold car and uh, get on the road. Um, and of course, you know, when you can get out of your car, all the better um, for transit or, uh, you know, biking or other um, walking if, if you're able. Uh, are important ways of kind of reducing the number of trips or the, the number of miles traveled. Uh, Minnesota is also good for uh, a lot of alternative fuels um, that I'll, I'll highlight real quick as well. Um, you know, about 400,000 Minnesotans drive uh, uh, what are known as flex fuel vehicles. These are vehicles designed to switch uh, between gasoline or uh, high ethanol blends, anywhere up to 85% ethanol. Uh, so when they use E85 in a flex fuel vehicle, it reduces the, uh, the nitrogen oxide emissions, the NOx that form ozone. Uh, it also has about a 25% reduction in uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions for the, a life cycle basis. Um, Minnesota has more E85 locations than any, anywhere else in the nation, uh, about 365, in, including a couple in Bloomington and um, most every surrounding community. Um, and uh, it also tends to be more Minnesotan and a little more homegrown. So th there are a number of economic advantages, too. Minnesota is also kind of on the front edge of uh, the other biofuel realm of biodiesel. Um, we, we mix a little bit of biodiesel in every gallon uh, of, of diesel fuel sold in Minnesota. This is particularly good for dropping uh, particulate emissions uh, coming out of older diesel ve uh, vehicles. Um, it also has a very beneficial life cycle greenhouse gas uh, benefits. Uh, and next week, we will up uh, the amount of biodiesel used in Minnesota to a 20% standard. Um, so we'll be the first in the nation to do that uh, during our warm weather months. Um, seen a growing number of stations that you might, you might notice out there are selling an 88 octane fuel, um, kind of a strange little thing that's popping up everywhere. But this is a 15% ethanol blend. Um, so all the gasoline sold in Minnesota is a 10% ethanol blend. Um, 15 just gives, it gives you a little bit of, of benefit with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and can reduce some of the other pollution uh, forms. And then, um, you know, a lot of people say the, the future is electric, I guess, for, for vehicles. And I say the future is here now. Um, there are a couple of dozen types of electric vehicles uh, available out here. Um, we coordinate a, pro a program called Midwest Evolve that's uh, with partners across seven states in the upper Midwest, uh, working to try to help people recognize that electric vehicles can be a lot of fun. Uh, they work in a lot of situations, uh, and but they're relatively new. So it's, it's an effort to try to help introduce people to electric vehicles. Uh, so we operate a, a website, midwestevolve.org, uh, where people can find ride and drive events and other information about, um, you know, how electric vehicles might fit into uh, your own lifestyles. Um, skipping back up to the federal side real quick, um, you know, the EPA is kind of examining, I guess you'd say, a, a number of policy reviews right now that um, have consequences for what we do. Um, you know, in Minnesota, we we can try our best to, you know, to, to work on vehicle issues, but in many ways we're kind of at the um, mercy of, of federal standards and things like that. So um, it's important, I think, for us to play a role in those federal standards as well. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has recently announced they're going to 
um, initiate a review of what fuel efficiency standards for cars will look like, um, particularly for model years 2022 and 2025. So that's the, the cars the vehicle makers are, are just about to commit to making uh, engine-wise. Um, so that standard is going to need public input. It's going to need a, a lot of involvement uh, of outside folks. So uh, I encourage everybody to kind of look for those opportunities to be a part of that. Similarly, the uh, EPA has, um, I get, how would you promote that? The uh, has uh, decided the clean power plan that was developed under the last administration is not exactly what they wanted. Um, and so they, by law, they need to put out some sort of plan for uh, dealing with emissions from, from coal-fired power plants um, that will need to be developed uh, and will need public input processes, if I'm correct, yes, of, uh, under the letter of the law for the Clean Air Act. Uh, they need to be working on emissions from coal-fired power plants. Um, so that is, again, an opportunity for, for people to be involved in kind of a national discussion about uh, what, what we want for clean air. Um, and similarly, there should be oil and gas emission discussion. So, you know, what's going on with pipelines and uh, well sites and all that kind of stuff. Are, those standards will, are be coming up for discussion. Um, if, if you want to happen to get uh, alerts, that kind of stuff for, you know, action uh, items from the Lung Association, uh, we, we operate the fightingforair.org uh, website where you can sign up for action alerts uh, and, and be notified of those kind of involvements and um, get key tips and that kind of thing. Uh, so I will end that now. I know we'll be talking state level stuff a little bit later, but um, for that, thank you again for the opportunity to be here and uh, look forward to the conversations. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We've got our third speaker coming up, um, Amanda Jarrett Smith. She is with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. She's actually the policy planner and clean energy coordinator at MPCA. She's got a master of public administration with a focus on environmental policy from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, a BA with Carleton College. And with that, Amanda, come on up and she'll be talking to us a little bit about what's going on at the state level here. She's one of our people that we have working for us at one of our agencies. So it's a great um, benefit for us and a special visit that we have from Amanda here tonight. Hi, <clears throat> thank you all for having me and happy Earth Day. Um, every day is Earth Day at the PCA. I just want to say that. But um, I was asked to talk a little bit about air quality in, at the state level and um, specifically the Volkswagen settlement, which I think many of us have been hearing about in the news over the past year or so. Um, so I was asked to give a little bit of an introduction to the PCA in case you're not that familiar with us. Um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is Minnesota's uh, air and water and land agency. We um, ensure that we are, uh, our mission is to protect and improve the environment and human health. And who are we? We are public servants, scientists, data geeks, uh, educators, partners, and much more. Um, and again, uh, acting to protect our land, water, and air here in Minnesota. And we have lots of great stuff up on our website if you want to kind of explore a little bit more. And specifically about air quality, what do we do? We do a lot of different things. Um, we regulate uh, large facilities. We write air permits and um, ensure that facilities comply with them. We monitor our air quality, as you saw in some of the earlier graphs, to make sure that we're uh, complying with all the national air quality standards. Um, we innovate, so as um, new uh, understanding comes about, uh, about air quality, um, we're often on the cutting edge of that, doing research and figuring out solutions to those problems. We also collaborate with um, partners here and communities and businesses to help um, get voluntary emissions reductions. And then we work to educate as well. We um, go out and talk to people like this uh, about air quality. We have a lot of educational information on our website. And so we're trying to help people understand the impacts of air quality on folks' health um, and what you can do to both reduce your emissions and um, reduce your exposures to air pollution. 
So as um, the previous speakers have mentioned, air quality has improved a lot in Minnesota and across the country. Um, but air pollution still affects our health, even at the levels that we're experiencing here in Minnesota. Um, and it doesn't affect everyone equally. And part of that is um, that sources of our air pollution we often think about as big smokestacks, but they really are in our neighborhoods near where we live, work, and play. Um, so they can be um, small businesses, they can be our vehicles, um, they can also be choices that we make about how we maintain our yard and uh, whether or not we burn a fire in our backyard. Um, and actually today in Minnesota, um, those large smokestack facilities only make up less than a quarter of the overall emissions in our state. Um, the rest of it is coming from those smaller sources that are all over and in our neighborhoods and communities. Um, so as you can see, cars and trucks are a big one. Um, also, uh, how we're heating and air conditioning our, our uh, homes and businesses and whether or not, you know, again, we're burning wood in our fireplaces and backyards. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about uh, vehicle pollution today. Um, and vehicle pollution is really important, as again has been stated a couple times, when we think about environmental justice. Um, because um, as a study that was mentioned earlier um, showed us, communities of color and lower income in Minnesota uh, drive less, they own fewer vehicles, they rely more on public transit, and they produce, therefore, less transportation-related air emissions. Um, but they are exposed to higher levels of traffic pollution um, because of those large um, roadways and highways that cut through their communities. And so how do we reduce vehicle pollution? I kind of think about this in three buckets. Um, the first would be that federal regulation, so the federal government can make regulations about um, the type of fuel we can burn. Um, it can talk about the types of um, pollution controls we need on our vehicles, the, how efficient our vehicles should be. Um, the second thing is transportation planning. Uh, we can encourage people to ride public transit, take a bike, walk, um, by making those things more convenient and more appealing. Um, we can also work on our roadways to try to reduce congestion. And then the third thing, uh, relates to our consumer and business choices. So these are the decisions that we make every day about whether we get in our car onto a bus um, or if we are going to buy an SUV or a small car. Um, and those types of decisions really do play in a role in the type of, in the level of air pollution that we have in the state. So today, I'm going to talk about an opportunity to start to um, kind of bend the curve a little bit on consumer and business decisions which is not something that we always get to do at the Pollution Control Agency. So Volkswagen. Um, Volkswagen cheated on federal emission standards for vehicles in their diesel cars and SUVs. Um, they were producing 30 to 40 times the level of nitrogen oxides, or NOx, that are allowed. Um, and they were caught. And they are now on the hook to pay for cleanup of that pollution um, and more. And so this is an opportunity to, uh, with the funding that we're getting through the VW settlement, to reduce pollution um, even beyond what Volkswagen um, caused, and also to advance our transportation into kind of the future of our transportation system in the state. Um, so some of these pollutants are getting to be pretty familiar to you all, I think, tonight, but nitrogen oxides, again, those help, those uh, contribute to the formation of ground-level ozone, and they're the subject of the violation. So that was what um, Volkswagen vehicles were polluting too much of. Um, fine particles are, those are really the health driver, the health risk drivers when we're talking about diesel pollution. Um, they are a probable carcinogen, so they probably contribute to, um, to uh, cancer. And, um, and even though they're not some, the cause of the violation, we can achieve a, reductions of this pollutant as well as nitrogen oxides through this funding. Um, and the same goes for greenhouse gases, which cause climate change. Um, we are, are able to get reductions in th from this pollutant as well as nitrogen oxides with this funding. So in 
Minnesota, we're receiving $47 million over 10 years. Uh, that amount was determined based on how many of the violating vehicles we have registered in our state. Um, and the settlement is set up to allow states and tribes to do basically two things. The first and the main thing is to take old heavy-duty diesel vehicles and equipment out of commission and replace them with new heavy-duty vehicles and equipment. And that old stuff has to be diesel. And the new stuff can be diesel, but it can also be other alternative fuels like uh, propane, natural gas, or electric. And then we're able to use up to 15% of the funds on um, electric vehicle charging stations. And so why is it set up like this? Um, overall, it's because the violation was for diesel, and so we want to clean up diesel pollution. Um, and it was for mobile sources, so it was for vehicles, and so we want to reduce pollution from that type of source. And this is the kind of the structure that we were given by the settlement, but within that, we can make choices that make the most sense for Minnesota and what we want to see here in our state. So why would we want to replace old diesels? Diesel, an old diesel truck can be producing as much pollution as 40, uh, excuse me, 30 um, new diesel trucks. Um, this is because in about the past 10 years or so, we've had kind of a revolution in heavy duty diesel equipment. Um, so I could make a similar graphic to this, uh, comparing other types of diesel equipment, so tugboats or um, buses, that sort of thing. Um, and I could also make a very similar graphic um, showing alternative fuels like propane and natural gas. So we can get some really significant reductions by getting those really old, dirty um, diesels out of commission and replacing them with new stuff. And then why would we want to encourage electric vehicles? Um, we cannot, with this funding, buy um, light duty cars and SUVs. Um, so, but we can achieve some significant emissions reductions by moving away from gasoline vehicles and towards electric. And the reason for this is that we know that even on our grid today, our electric system today, um, an, a, an electric car produces less emissions than a gasoline car. Um, so moving away from that gasoline car to an electric, we can get um, some good emissions reductions. And one of the best ways to do that is to build charging stations because a lot of people feel that the reason that they can't um, kind of make that leap to an electric vehicle is because they are afraid of um, getting stranded. They're not used to the technology, um, and it's, it's kind of a whole new way of thinking about things. And so um, getting those charging stations out there so that people feel comfortable getting into an electric vehicle um, is one of the best ways that we have of encouraging that transition. So um, all states have to produce a state plan um, to get it reviewed and approved at the federal level. Um, and Minnesota uh, wanted to develop a plan that reflected the needs and desires of Minnesotans. So we started out early, um, over a year ago, taking input on this. We had, oh, let's see, um, I think 15 public meetings. Uh, we received about 1,000 written comments and over 800 responses to online surveys. Um, we also considered, of course, the settlement requirements and talked to the federal trustee that's managing the money to understand what we are allowed to do. Um, there's a lot of legalese in the settlement that we had to wade, wade through. Um, we had some technical meetings with folks who own diesel equipment or know a lot about electric vehicles to better understand this technology and, and the opportunities here in Minnesota. Um, we've been working with the legislature to get their input on, and we've presented to the legislature at several um, hearings, and we've also had a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations to understand what um, they feel are important to, to their constituents. Um, we've been working with the tribes within Minnesota. Tr uh, the tribes have access to a national tribal fund, and they're also eligible to apply for funds through us. Um, and so we've been working to try to um, look for opportunities for collaboration where we can um, benefit all Minnesotans, including those who um, live on uh, reservations. And then we've been uh, consulting agency expertise. We have about 10 years of experience running a similar but much, much smaller program. Um, and we have a lot of data and a lot of modeling that we've been able to do to try to think about what are some of the best options for us uh, here in Minnesota. 
And just a little bit about what we've heard. Um, these, uh, in kind of an early round of, um, of public meetings and online surveys, we used a, a tool that I call affectionately uh, dotmocracy. And so it's kind of a high level way of us to get a sense of some of these key themes, the key issues that people want us to think about as we develop our plan. So as you can see, we heard a lot about environmental justice. Um, we heard a lot about considering health impacts of diesel. Um, also being cost-effective managers of this money, um, and in making sure that we're investing statewide. And so, after a year of engagement, ta-da, we have a plan! <laughs> and actually, it was released oh, just a few weeks ago, the final plan. We released a draft plan earlier this winter and um, took that around the state again and got more input on it. And we wanted to make sure that people had an opportunity to tell us whether or not they think we did a good job. So uh, we did that and we made some revisions based on that input and we finalized our plan a few weeks ago. Um, this plan is for only phase one of the program. So we decided that we wanted to build into the program opportunities for further input, for further analysis, and for new um, technology that we hope come online in future years. So this phase is for 2018 and 2019. It's the first 25% of the funds. Um, and so we'll, this is kind of an opportunity in a couple years to um, come back out and talk to more people and get input on what, what they think we're doing well and what we could improve on going to the second phase of uh, the funding. We set 10, uh, we set 10 year goals, um, five 10 year goals. Um, for ourselves. The first is to achieve significant emissions reductions and we have concrete goals for nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and greenhouse gases. Um, we have a goal of investing 60% of the funds in the Twin Cities metropolitan area and 40% in greater Minnesota. That's based on where the violating vehicles were registered in our state. Um, we have a goal to invest 40% of the funds in disproportionately impacted communities. Um, using a mapping tool that we have. Um, we are going to prioritize reducing exposure and maximizing health benefits, and we're working with the Department of Health to develop a methodology for doing that in project selection. Um, and then we want to balance cost effectiveness with these other important goals. So phase one in 2018 and 2019 will have um, five grant programs. These will be things that folks can um, apply into and we'll have a um, competitive grant, process, grant selection process. Um, the first is 20% of the funds going to school buses. Um, we did this, we developed this program because we heard from a lot of people a lot of concerns about exposures of children um, to school buses when they're riding on them and waiting for the bus and that sort of thing. So. Um, we have that. 35% uh, is to go to transit buses and trucks. Um, this category is where we think we have the most opportunity for really significant emissions reductions. Um, there's a lot of these in the state, um, and they are pretty cost effective for us to um, change out. Off-road equipment, that's things like uh, tugboats and switcher locomotives, which are locomotives that move things around in rail yards, um, construction equipment. Um, these pieces of equipment, a lot of them have no pollution controls on them at all. They can last for decades. Um, and so <clears throat> they, we can get some really, really significant emissions reductions by changing out the engines in these pieces of equipment. And then the number one thing that we heard from people is that we should um, look for opportunities to transition towards electric vehicles. So we have two programs related to electric vehicles. The first is heavy duty electric vehicle um, program and that will change out old diesels for um, electric alternatives. Um, this is an opportunity for us to learn more about this technology in the state. Um, it's a really new technology. It's pretty expensive still. So it's an opportunity for us to, to better understand how this might work in the state um, and kind of position us for potentially more opportunities into the future as the technology becomes less expensive and um, more useful in more cases. And then um, we have, um, we plan to invest the maximum 15% that we're allowed to in electric vehicle charging stations. And of that, um, most of that is, is going to go towards electric vehicle fast charging corridors along our highways so that 
everyone in Minnesota can travel all around the state um, using electric vehicles. Um, a smaller portion will go towards um, more slower chargers, which are more useful at places where you're going to park for a long time. So like a public park or maybe your workplace or in, a, in an apartment building, that sort of thing. But they're significantly less expensive, so we can get a lot of them for much less money. So how many vehicles will we um, change out in just this first phase? Um, around 300. And, um, and then we're expecting to be able to charge about in, install about 65 um, electric vehicle charging stations around the state. And how much pollution will we eliminate? So Volkswagen, we've calculated, um, emitted about 600 extra tons of nitrogen oxide into Minnesota's air. Nitrogen oxides, excuse me. Um, and so in phase one alone, we will reduce um, emissions beyond what uh, Volkswagen produced. And within the 10 years, we'll we plan to, if we achieve our goals, which we will, um, we will have reduced um, around seven times the amount of pollution that Volkswagen uh, emitted into our air. So who can apply for funding? Um, if you have a heavy duty vehicle or equipment, a piece of equipment, if you or your group um, wants to install electric vehicle charging stations, so this is not the type of thing that you put in your garage, but it's more for you know kind of a broader use. Um, and if you're a business, a government, or a nonprofit, you're eligible. Um, and what comes next? We are going to have applications open for funding starting this summer. The first um, applications will be for school buses and electric vehicle charging stations, and that should open very soon in May or June. Um, and um, then we'll be doing future plan revisions, like I mentioned, um, and getting out there and talking to folks again. And we'll be tracking and reporting our progress towards those goals. And how can you get involved? So if you own a piece of equipment like this, or a company that you work for does, you can apply. Um, if you want to install, like I said, an electric vehicle charging station at your workplace or apartment building or um, in a, you know, your community center, um, you can also apply. Um, and I would, I would say one of the things I hear a lot is, well, I don't own, um, you know, a diesel truck. I mean, how many of us do? But, you know, I might live in a community where there's a facility that has a lot of diesel trucks coming in and out. This is a really good opportunity to get some reductions out of um, those vehicles. Um, so working with um, community members and partnership to encourage facilities or um, a lot of um, a lot of governments own the, this type of equipment, you know, encouraging them to apply for funding um, to reduce their vehicle emissions is um, another thing that community members can do. And then um, in a couple years when we're out trying to get more input on the plan, we'd really like to hear again from people if they think that we've used the funds wisely and if there are things that they think that we should be doing um, better or differently. Um, into the future. And so on our website, we have a VW webpage that has, a, if you want to dive into some data, let me tell you, it's super fun. Um, but there's a lot of stuff on our website. Um, that's where we'll be posting all the information about applications. And if you want to follow what we're up to, um, sign up for our emails on that website. You'll find out about plan revisions. You'll find out about open applications. Um, and, and yeah. It's, it's, and so thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, this is my contact information. And I will also put in a plug. If you want to learn more about air quality in general and what the state is up to and what our partners are up to, we have a quarterly newsletter called Airmail. And that's where you can sign up for it. Um, and uh, it, it's a shameless plug because I edit it. But I think it's really great. So um, <laughs> you should sign up for it. And um, thank you so much for having me and um, being here to talk about this really important topic. I guess I'd like to start us out here with our panelists each having a couple minutes so they can reflect on what they heard from the other partners, as well as any last statements they'd want to do for a minute or two each. and then. I'll gather up some questions and we can start passing those through to them. So um, if you guys want to, I think your mics should be on right at the table. Maybe we can test that too. It looks like it, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So 
So if you have a couple things you want to say from maybe a reflection on what other speakers said or any kind of um, summary of what you'd want to say, that you have a couple minutes and then we'll start to take questions. And I appreciate that. Um, I hadn't really thought about this very hard. <laughs> uh, I think, so a couple things re re reflecting. I think, um, first of all, the airmail thing is great. So sign up for that. It's a great summary of what's going on in Minnesota. If you really want to stay involved in what's going on with policy and, and air pollution issues, that's a, a, a great way to do that. Um, the other thing I didn't touch on is that, you know, Bloomington has two major interstates that intersect going through it. And, and I don't know much about um, who lives where in Bloomington, um, but this is a very local issue to the city here as far as um, vehicle traffic and potential inequities in exposure and health outcomes, just like it is in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So it, it's something that for your city is, is just as critical as, as everywhere else. Um, and lastly, I, I think I, I want to sort of recognize the, the collaborations that go across different partnerships, the university, government agencies, nonprofit groups. Um, we all are part of uh, a, an effort called Clean Air Minnesota that's looking for ways to reduce emissions of different um, uh, pollutants that contribute to air pollution, uh, different chemicals. Uh, and there's a lot of collaborations. I mentioned that paper that uh, I mentioned from the MPCA authors. Two of those uh, authors were students of mine at, at one point, and um, Greg Pratt, the lead author, is an adjunct professor at the university. And so, um, you know, th there's a lot of collaborations that go back and forth among the different groups, and I think that's important to realize that that is going on kind of behind the scenes. All right. Um, I'll, I'll add a couple of things. Uh, a couple of other programs that like to sort of tie uh, Clean Air Minnesota and the Pollution Control Agency together, I'll mention. Um, one is uh, the, there's a program called, or there's a website that the Pollution Control Agency operates with the Department of Health called Be Air Aware. Um, that's uh, got a number of good tips and uh, is helpful things such as uh, if, if, you know, you have influence at uh, your workplace, that kind of stuff, they can sign up to help um, spread alerts when there are air quality, uh, in air quality days where, where we're uh, above sort of health protective thresholds, uh, alerts will go out and um, workplaces can be very helpful ways of, of kind of spreading those messages and encouraging people to take tips um, that, that will reduce their own emissions. Um, so I know there's information about uh, signing up on, on the Be Air Aware website. Um, just signing up for uh, air quality um, alerts as well, which you can do through the, the uh, Pollution Control Agency's website, is a handy way of kind of keeping an eye on um, what air pollution levels are like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can set it up for, for different alerts at different thresholds, that kind of stuff, depending on your own personal interests. Um, I also want to express my uh, ap appreciation to the Pollution Control Agency. Uh, I think through you know our Department of Energy Clean Cities partnerships and through the Lung Association nationally, we were kind of able to kind of see what a lot of these uh, Volkswagen conversations look like throughout the country, and w who was taking input from from whom and and how plans got to developed. Uh, and I. I think the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency did a, a fantastic job of actually uh, getting public input and putting in a tremendous amount of effort uh, at getting that and then um, designing a plan that actually really reflected that. Um, having talked with a lot of the staff who worked on that for a couple of years now, I know um, they really kind of set aside any kind of personal opinions going into it. Uh, and uh, I can picture people at a lot of the public hearings that I went to who were, who were advocating for exactly the, you know, the five pieces of the pie that, that came out. Um, and I, I can definitely attest that Amanda would not let you get into the room without giving you three dots for your votes. Uh, so it, it, uh, I, I think the plan very, very well reflects uh, the input that they got. And I think they uh, did a tremendous job getting more in input than a lot of other states have. Um, one thing I'll flag, I know um, this, this being the, the League of Women Voters and uh, having in previous lives gotten to work with uh, a number of, of, of League people on different um, policy issues. I know you, you guys tend to have better relationships with legislators than, than most. Um, and one issue I, I will mention is that the, at the state legislature, there has been legislation introduced that um, I think 
you know, op optimistically, I'd, I'd say it was introduced. Uh, it, the, it's a very short piece of legislation that uh, essentially limits how much money the PCA can spend on implementing the Volkswagen plan. Uh, the, the federal EPA, when they, they settled the lawsuit with Volkswagen, said um, people could spend up to 15% of the money, of the state monies, are $47 million in our case, on the actual administration, the, the getting public input, the getting projects out there, that kind of thing. Um, there's been legislation introduced that would limit that to 3%. Um, which optimistically is designed to to ensure that a lot of that money goes to the projects it's it's intended for, um, but my fear is that that may be overly restrictive uh, and prohibit the PCA from from being able to solicit uh, as as widespread of projects as they might. Uh, it may limit the kind of feedback they seek uh, when it comes time to to evaluate round one and look at, at details for round two. Um, so I, I'm I'm not trying to raise giant red flags or alarm bells or anything like that, but it is um, concerning limitations. So I, I would encourage you all, uh, if you've liked what you've heard about the Volkswagen program, that kind of stuff, and you happen to be in conversations with your legislators, uh, to really let them know what, what you think about it and uh, about the uh, these kind of issues and um, if you find out more, that kind of thing. So um, it's just one I flag for you as, as you're kind of being a part of those conversations. Thank you. Kind of, oh, I kind of got the last word, um, so I, I th and they said all the things I was going to highlight about collaboration and how important that is for us, um, and and um, uh, oh, and signing up for air quality alerts. So, I will. I want to hear questions. That's more important to me. So, yeah. Well, thank you. I do have the questions now, so I'll try to read these. Um, the first one up is someone is asking a question about, I worry about cycling to work while getting exercise. I am also breathing quite a bit of exhaust. Am I doing myself more harm than good? Let's start out with that question. Open to anyone. Yeah. No, I was okay. Gonna I was going to say that guys. that was actually tied to um, the professor's uh, slide earlier. The uh, he, he mentioned a, um, a research study where they, they literally were biking around Minneapolis-St. Paul with uh, air monitors behind them. Um, and they, you know, one of their conclusions, I think, was that if, if you can do side streets versus main streets, uh, there are definitely uh, a reductions in the emissions that you're exposed to. Um, you know, I, I think the questioner is, is right to think about the fact that you know, as you're cycling, you are breathing deeper, you're breathing more frequently. Uh, you have the, potent the potential to be exposed to a lot more pollutants. Um, it's not always practical to be on the, s the side roads, and um, you know how bike lanes are designed and where they're designed, that kind of stuff can definitely have an influence on uh, what you'll be exposed to at that time. Um, so it, it, it definitely is a good example of, I guess, why um, smart design in cities is, is, can have uh, lasting implications. Um, and where we put our bike paths and that kind of stuff can have definite importance. But still a good thing to do. Uh, and I, I, you're probably, I think you still net out more healthy than if you didn't bike to work. Um, but you can, uh, you can definitely be careful about where you're biking. Yeah, if you, the, the, to the extent that you can use greenways, parkways, things like that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be better for it because um, as, as the data show, the farther you are away from major arteries, then uh, the lower the exposures that you'll, re you'll receive. Thank you. Um, my, the next question I have here is, what rules are there on cleaning chemicals used in places like health clubs and schools? So is there... I work on outdoor air, so I don't oh. have any idea. <laughs> um, there, there are, you know, I, I guess I don't have a good answer for that because I don't think there are a lot of strong rules related to that. There are workplace exposure rules for um, chemicals that uh, um, maintenance staff, uh, cleaning staff would, would be able to be exposed to. Um, so that that would limit their exposures, and then to some extent, um, if they're that they're, to the extent that they're being used at, at hours when students are in, in school, that would that would influence um, students' exposures too. But I don't know that there's a lot of rules around, um, you know, what what chemicals can and, and cannot be used in schools. 
Yeah, I'm not aware of either. I think that would be sort of individual policies. Um, I can mention that the Pollution Control Agency does have a, a loan program for small businesses who want to uh, cut down on some of their chemical uses, like um, paint shops, or auto body shops, that kind of stuff, uh, to kind of provide assistance for, for companies who do want to reduce those exposures. So there are some really good success stories of, of places that have uh, created more healthy environments for their employees and, and reduced the kind of VOCs that we were talking about earlier. Grants so are open now for that. Yeah. <laughs> city city of Minneapolis had a, an effort to remove a chemical called perchloroethylene from dry cleaners, and they they um, just a few months ago uh, uh, had the last dry cleaner that was using uh, perk in Minneapolis um, switched over to a different technology. So that's oh. an effort that would be great to see expanded to other cities as well. Minneapolis is the first city in the country to voluntarily um, get rid of all perk um, in all its dry cleaners. Something Bloomington could be the second for. And it's a it's a health hazard, um, you know, emissions generally, but also to workers and people who may be in nearby uh, businesses and residences. I have a couple of questions that have to do with. Um, greenhouse gases, I guess, but one of them is, can someone speak to at atmospheric CO2 mitigation? Is that real and attainable? And I want to add on to that, the six EPA ambient air quality standards, there wasn't carbon dioxide. I'm wondering why or if that's in the mix. Well, I can answer the second one more easily than the, than the first. Um, so, so carbon dioxide is not considered a cr criteria air pollutant because it's not uh, it, it, it's not considered a human health hazard directly like, like the others tend to be. So it was, it's not listed as a criteria air pollutant. Um, EPA um, in the previous ad administration um, was argued that it can be regulated because it does create um, ultimately human hazards. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's been litigation around that too. So. Um, so it, it's not considered a criteria air pollutant for that reason. It's, it's um, regulated for other reasons. Yeah, so it's regulated um, based on source-specific um, regulations. So that's what the Clean Power Plan it was that, um, that John mentioned. Um, there's also regulations related to um, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions from vehicle tailpipes, um, and these are both things that are currently being um, rolled back by the current EPA. Reevaluated. 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 Yes. <laughs> Re Though going to electric vehicles addresses this, that could be a mitigation, correct? Correct. So um, um, our, our um, electric generation system is moving away from coal at a pretty rapid rate and on to cleaner um, fuels and renewables, and so as we transition away from coal, um, that makes electric vehicles an even more desirable um, transition away from um, gasoline and diesel, um, because we can kind of ride that cleaning of the electric system towards a cleaner transportation system as well. Thank you. Um, again, a personal one here. What's the best way to reduce backyard fires? don't have them. Um, <laughs> but I think that is a challenge, right? Um, because you can personally not have one, but I think a lot of times your neighbors may. Um, so I, I think you two probably work on uh, f wood smoke more than I do. Do you have, I don't know if you have anything. I mean, there's, there's efforts to, to try to um, develop education um, campaigns to, to, to be more public about, uh, you know, the hazards associated with them. Uh, when there are air alerts, one of the recommendations is to not have backyard fires um, because they can make the situation worse. Um, so I, I, you know, there, there's there's not an, an easy way to just regulate and say thou uh, shalt not have a backyard fire, but trying to educate um, your neighbors have have conversations with your neighbors if. Uh, you know, they, they regularly burn and, and uh, you know, try to explain to them, uh, you know, gently, uh, I think, because that, that there, it does create hazards and per, 
perhaps uh, particularly using um, the, the effects on children and who may have asthma and older people who uh, may also have a variety of health effects that could be impacted by inhalation of particles. Yeah. We do get contacted regularly by, by people who kind of get trapped in their house, you know, when a neighbor is having a, a backyard fire because, um, you know, and closing your windows, turning on the air conditioner is kind of what we kind of say to try to mitigate effects, but, um, you know, that, that doesn't always work. Um, so a lot of it is getting to know your neighbors, that kind of stuff, I think, making sure uh, if you have a respiratory condition that your neighbors know it uh, and that they kind of pay attention to where their smoke is going. Um, there are kind of tips of, you know, when you use dry wood, that kind of stuff, it can reduce uh, the amount of smoke coming off of wood if, if people are burning. Um, I think a lot of the times people are gathering around fires uh, j just as a social thing and f for the sake of being social, it's not because of the fire, that's just kind of the excuse. Uh, and you don't really need the fire in the middle of that to, to have that good time with your neighbors. You know, it, um, there are there are non-wood, uh, I guess, recreation, you know, backyard uh, fire elements you can use that are propane or, uh, you know, otherwise just light up or other kind of things. So you don't necessarily need to burn the wood um, or you can just get together in the backyard and you know have beers and and enjoy each other without the the fire in the middle of it um usually more enjoyable and sometimes if you're not running from the smoke um but i think a lot of it in the ideal world a lot of it's good, having good conversations with neighbors and um when when you can that's not always possible but uh if not there there are tips on on how people can reuse things and and you should always avoid burning things like brush and other kind of things that that come down and um because that that will create that much more smoke there's a couple questions here that have to do with um, people interested in finding out the either or of these different choices that we make. And one is, Mr. Hunter encouraged us to choose ethanol because it is better for air, but isn't it worse for our water? And causing the nitrates in water. And the other is, are hybrid cars good for our air quality because they are less, they use less gas, or on balance are they more polluting because of the pollution caused in making their batteries? So we have a lot of questions about how to, what are trade-offs with the transitions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to take one or the other or both or. Um, well, I'll, I can talk about a little bit about electric vehicles. Um, I think that that um, issue is something that a lot of people raise um, when. Uh, they are thinking about electric vehicles, but the studies that have been done so far um, indicate that the life cycle, uh, I mean, there's, there's life cycle emissions associated with your regular vehicle too. Um, and that, um, that on net, you know, the battery electric vehicle is gonna be a cleaner vehicle through the life cycle of the vehicle. Um, and, and also, um, tailpipe emissions, because they're close to where we live and where we are every day, are of particular concern because they're, they're those things that we're breathing in in our neighborhoods um, rather than being more diffuse throughout the entire system. I, I know sometimes that's kind of uh, doesn't sound that nice, but you know, when it's being diff diffuse everywhere, it's a little bit better than being closer to where you are when you're breathing it in. Thank you. There, yeah, I would just add that there are really trade-offs with every fuel and every type. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know of a, the perfect transportation fuel out there. Um, Your legs I mean, and yeah. arms. <laughs> yeah. Um, Human energy. That's probably, <laughs> probably true, yeah. Um, you know, ethanol is, uh, it, you know, is um, a tricky word. People have to kind of figure out the balances for themselves. Um, and, when looking at you know water in minnesota i would compare it to as well to looking at where our petroleum comes from which um in minnesota is you know 70 percent of it comes from the alberta tar, tar sands up north which um are very energy intensive and very uh water intensive for for harvesting if you will um and so there are trade-offs with that as well um, it's not necessarily quite as close to home um but uh every fuel source we use i guess has its trade-offs mm -hmm. i uh the next question is, is there a preferred source of electric power generation regarding hydro versus nuclear? I don't know if that comes into play here, but. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that answer would depend on who you talk to. <laughs> um, 
I mean, nuclear certainly um, has, you know, fuel, spent fuel that it, you have to do something with. And it's not a really good solution right now as to what to do with it. Um, and for hydro, um, I think we're getting, we in society are, seem to be getting a little bit better about how we're doing that. Um, we're not, for the most part, just wiping out um, cultural heritage sites and um, you know communities and things like that, um, and and a little bit smarter about how it's impacting the ecosystem. But um, you know, I, I don't think that I have a, a very strong um, comment on on that. Which direction? Anyway, yeah. Okay. Are there any steps being taken to crack down on the various kinds of pollution caused by animal agriculture? Um, That's a tough nut to crack. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard when you get into agriculture. It's. Um, it really is. Uh, the margins for farmers are so thin. It gets to be pretty hard when you start talking about regulating that sort of thing. Um, I would recommend a vegetarian diet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And our last question, what kinds of volunteer work can be done for the American Lung Association? Oh, so nice. <laughs> that'll be nice right. to hear yeah. as well. Who did you plant? <laughs> That's a fine question. Um, well, there are a variety of things, I think, that, uh, that can be done, depending on how, how um, hands-on and folks want to get. Um, you know, as, as mentioned, we have the, the Midwest Evolve project, which uh, is, is really about uh, enabling people to have kind of first-hand experiences with uh, electric vehicles. So um, a portion of that is, is kind of surveying people when they come and go uh, before test drives and, and kind of being a lot of our, our outreach is through events that kind of take places at things like the Mall of America or other, other kind of opportunities like that where um, we really do need assistance in uh, kind of helping people just kind of go through the system and, and kind of uh, look at vehicles that way. Um, we, I'm sure, have a number of other volunteer opportunities that are just escaping me right at the top of that. Uh, you can look on the website, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, uh, reach out to us, and I'm sure we can plug you into a, a, a variety of opportunities depending on your interests. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for the great questions. Um, I guess with that, we wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.